Hey everyone, Julie here with Equip the Light, where we equip you with the knowledge of Jesus and His Word so that you can know Him and walk in the calling that He has for you. Today we are covering the recap for week 5 in the Jesus to Me Bible study in the Gospel of John. We're looking at John chapter 2 verses 12 through 25 where we cover Jesus' first cleansing of the temple. Stay tuned to the end because we're going to talk about what is a believer's basis of truth, how do believers speak truth in love, and how should we handle ourselves in the evil times that we live. Please subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you're always notified of when a new video posts. And please put your comments and questions in the comments below. And please like and share this video. You can find the free Bible study worksheets at our website at equipthelight.com forward slash Jesus to me. So let's get to it. Coming up next. After the wedding in Cana of Galilee, Jesus, his disciples, his mother, and his brothers went to Capernaum and stayed there for a few days. Then Jesus and his disciples went to Jerusalem because the Passover was near. This week we learned what happened when Jesus arrived at the temple in Jerusalem. Remember, it's believed by biblical scholars that John wrote the Gospel of John around AD 85, which was after the writings of the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three are called the Synoptic Gospels because they give a similar account and point of view of Jesus' life and ministry. John's Gospel gives us a bigger picture of what happened, particularly what happened in Jesus' ministry before the death of John the Baptist. We learn in John why the disciples followed Jesus so readily and also that they were associated with John the Baptist's revival of repentance at the Jordan River. While the synoptics concentrated on Jesus' ministry in Galilee, the Gospel of John emphasizes Jesus' ministry in Judea and Jerusalem, which throws light on the extremely hostile behavior of the religious Jewish leaders toward Jesus. The synoptic Gospels record Jesus' cleansing of the temple near the end of his ministry, but John reveals that there were actually two occasions where Jesus cleansed the temple, and that he did so at the outset of his ministry, which could account for part of the reason why the religious leaders so strongly opposed him even at the beginning of his ministry. John also clarifies the timing of Jesus' ministry that it lasted three and a half years, not two and a half years, and scholars believe that some events weren't covered by John in his gospel, like the second cleansing of the temple, because it had already been fully covered in the other synoptic gospels. So when Jesus entered the temple, he found tables set up with people selling animals, oxen, sheep, and doves to be used as sacrifices as well as money changers exchanging currency. They were doing business and making a profit. To have a greater understanding of why this was so offensive to Jesus, let's look at how the temple was set up and the practices that led to the situation. In the NIV Archaeological Study Bible, an article titled Herod's Temple describes the layout of the temple as consisting of a series of concentric courts, each of increasing holiness as one came closer to the center of the temple. So the outer court there was the court of the Gentiles, then there was the court of women, and then there was court of Israel where only ritually clean Jewish men could enter. After that, there is the holy place where the priests were allowed to go, and then within that is the most high place where only the high priest could go on the Day of Atonement once a year. The outermost circle was the court of the Gentiles, which was where the money changers and the animal sellers had set up shop. This area was open to both the Jews and the Gentiles, men and women, children and beggars, as well as the blind and the lame. Only the outer circle was open to all people of all nations and was supposed to be a place of prayer for all. When we take a look at the Synoptic Gospels, you'll notice Jesus makes a different statement than he does here. He says, It is written, And my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Jesus was not only angry at the extortion that was taking place, but he was angry at the fact that the money changers' use of the area was limiting people's access and use of this area of the temple as it was intended. Jews would come from all over the Roman Empire to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast and observances. And when they arrived, they had to exchange money into the local currency and to pay the temple tax. And so money changers were making an exorbitant profit from this business. Animal sacrifice could only be offered at the temple in Jerusalem according to the Law of Moses. It would be impractical for travelers to bring their own animals on such a long journey, so people would sell them animals as a convenience. 
what was intended to be a place where everyone was welcome to come and pray had turned into a market of extortion. People with holy intentions were being taken advantage of and the house of prayer had become a house of greed. So to give you a modern example, it's like going on vacation or being in the airport and the prices are just exorbitant and hey, you're stuck there so you have to pay for it, otherwise you can't eat, right? But what makes this even worse is that it's occurring in a place of worship and so you're telling people who've traveled a long distance that, hey, if you don't pay up, you can't buy an animal for sacrifice and make your life right with God. So what was Jesus' reaction? He made a scourge of cords and used it to drive the sellers and animals from the temple. He poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those selling doves to take these things away, stop making my father's house a house of business. Jesus contrasts a house of prayer, purpose to communicate with God, with a house of business, purpose to make money for personal gain. Jesus' actions show that he viewed his father's house as a holy place, a place of worship and reconciliation. The disciples see this and they remembered the verse written in Psalm 69.9 about the righteous sufferer, that zeal for your house will consume me. Literally, this means in Greek, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So why did Jesus act so differently in this situation at the temple than he did at the wedding in Cana? And how did this affect his disciples? At the wedding, we saw a very hesitant Jesus meet a need to save the groom's family honor, which caused his disciple to believe in him. Jesus did the miracle of the water to wine in a somewhat private setting, so he didn't need to show his authority in doing so. But at the temple, the injustice was against his father and Jesus rose up in holy boldness and authority to defend his father's honor and his house of glory. Here the disciples learned how to stand up for God and bear reproach and persecution. In both instances, Jesus acted out of compassion, the first for the groom and his family and the second for the travelers coming to worship at the temple. Jesus' cleansing of the temple was met by persecution from the Jewish religious leaders because while he may have seemed radical, he was above reproach because scripture backed him up. The religious leaders should have cleansed the temple themselves and forbid these kind of practices in the place of worship. Jesus' actions and words should have shamed them or at the very least been taken as a rebuke for failing to protect the integrity of the Father's house. But the Jewish leaders responded with a challenge. What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Now, Jews in the first century believed that the ministry of a true prophet would be authenticated by a sign or a miraculous act by God that points to some action that should be taken by the people. John's Gospel is full of signs or miraculous acts of God performed by Jesus that authenticate that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, and the Son of God. Why did he write about them? So that the reader of the text may believe this and that by believing you may have eternal life in his name. So the religious leaders were saying to Jesus, show us a sign, meaning a token of divine authority and power, or an attesting miracle pointing to the supernatural power of God. But they weren't really looking for a sign in the true sense of the word. Strong's Concordance notes that they wanted a sign of an outward messianic kingdom of material greatness for the chosen people. With such cravings, the gospel of a crucified Messiah was a stumbling block indeed. So they were thinking that the Messiah would come and set up an earthly, worldly kingdom. But Jesus brought an incorruptible, spiritual kingdom, not of this temporal world. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They said, what do you mean? It took 46 years to build this temple. How could you build it in three days? Well, Jesus wasn't talking about the temple in Jerusalem, but the temple of his physical body. When Jesus was raised from the dead after three days, this was the sign Jesus was referring to. And it was after his resurrection that the disciples understood and remembered what Jesus had said. We learn that during the feast of the Passover, Jesus was performing signs and people were believing in him as a result. But we don't see the Jewish religious leaders believing openly in him because again, it wasn't the sign of setting up an earthly political kingdom like they wanted. Jesus didn't entrust himself to those who believed in him or followed him because he knew what was in man, that all people have a sinful nature designed to only profit themselves. And when push comes to shove, selfishness and self-preservation would take precedence over protecting Jesus. 
people don't have righteousness or goodness apart from Jesus. It's by grace working in us through our faith in his finished work on the cross that completely removes our sin and from which we obtain his righteousness. We can easily have the sin of self-righteousness and deceive ourselves into thinking that our own righteous good works or acts apart from him can measure up to his, but that is completely wrong according to scripture. We utterly need Jesus for everything pertaining to salvation, life, and reconciliation with God. Our good works done with a self-righteous attitude or motive are like filthy rags before the eyes of God. They're going to be burned up when they are tried by his holy fire. Jesus only entrusted his life to his Father and only sought guidance from him. Like Jesus, we too can entrust our lives to God because God loves us with the same love he has for Jesus. And that leads us to our discussion questions. The first asks, what should be a believer's basis of truth or standard for judging whether something is good or evil? We see all kinds of things on social media, in the news, in the government, in things that are taught in schools. And so we are constantly required to judge whether something is good or evil. God doesn't want us to guess what is right or wrong. He gave us his word, the Bible, and this is the basis of our truth as a believer, along with Jesus, who is the revealed living word and the way, the truth, and the life. The second discussion question asks, is there a time to confront evil practices with strong words and actions? Yes, when faced with an evil practice or some kind of cultural or political idea or ideology that is in direct conflict with the scripture, especially when it is attacking the essence of the good news of the gospel and the kingdom of God Jesus is building, then we as believers, his representatives on earth, should speak the truth that comes from the word, okay? Our basis for truth is the word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 states, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible also tells us that the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So when you see any actions or statements or worldly ideologies that want to do just that, steal, kill, or destroy, it's a no-brainer. It's flat out evil because Jesus is the opposite. He said he came to bring life to us and that we may have life more abundantly. The third question asks, what does one's authority in a situation have to do with the course of action one takes to oppose evil? Authority is based on knowledge and or position. So let's start with what worldly authority looks like, which is the right to exercise power or to do something that is lawful. A believer's authority is that, but it is greater because it is supernatural and based on the word of God. Think of Jesus' authority in the situation at the temple. His authority came from his relationship to the Father as the Son of God. So he had the authority to protect the integrity of his Father's house and he was being backed up by scripture. Your authority as a believer is the same. It comes from the fact that you are a child of God, so you have a relationship with God. Your authority is also based on whether you are correct or right in your position based on a correct understanding of the scripture. And your authority is based on whether you are led by the Holy Spirit rather than the flesh. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Whenever we speak as believers, we should speak the truth of the word and do so in love by the help of the Holy Spirit and the empowering grace of God. Because it's not about being right, it's not like some political argument. It's about allowing God to use you to influence and change the person to not only turn away from the evil practice or idea, but more importantly to find salvation and right standing with God and to live according to the word of God. It's really about souls. And if you have a chance this week, and check out Romans chapter 12, which shows us just how we should handle ourselves in this life. It talks about living our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can test and approve 
what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. We renew our mind by reading the word and getting it into our spirit. Romans 12 also teaches us to love sincerely, detest what is evil, to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. It says to be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and persistent in prayer. Then it talks about blessing those who persecute you. It says bless and do not curse. Do not repay anyone evil for evil or avenge yourself, but leave room for God's wrath. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we're called to love and practice forgiveness. But love and forgiveness does not equate to silence, acquiescence, or acceptance. As a whole, the modern American church for the past several years has done a terrible job of allowing evil practices and ideas to flourish with little or no opposition or reaction. If you think this is love, you're kidding yourself. Speaking the truth of the word in love is not, quote, judging someone. This modern turn of judging someone or don't judge me has been conflated with what scripture says about judging people and has been incorrectly understood by Christians. When the Bible says not to judge someone, in the Greek, it is using the word judge in the sense that you're condemning them to hell. It's not saying that you can't judge what is evil and what is good or judge actions and behavior as good or bad. When the Bible says not to judge someone, it is to be interpreted to not condemn them to hell, literally, or sit as the judge of their eternal destiny. It's saying don't write someone off and say, well, they're going to hell, so to hell they will go. In fact, if you really loved someone, you would want to turn them away from the path of destruction from the path of destructive actions and ideologies and warn them, especially if you know the illuminating truth of God's word. God gave you a mouth for a reason and God gave you the word of God for a reason. So get a good grip on God's truth in the Bible and get a good grip on God's love that he has for you and that he wants you to have for your neighbor and ingrain it in your heart and in your spirit and in your mind and then out of your heart in the love of Jesus, speak God's truth in love because it will be life to the hearer. And when you speak the word of God, nothing can stand against it. When you're speaking the truth of his word and you're doing so out of love with the ultimate goal of the reconciliation of the hearer to God, you are speaking his life. So speak life and not death. Bless and do not curse. And speak the truth of the word of God in love. That's all I have for today. Keep up the good work. Next week we have such a rich topic and are covering what it means to be born of the Spirit. When Nicodemus, a Pharisee and ruler of the Jews, comes to Jesus at night, seeking the truth behind who Jesus really is. See you then. Equip the Light wants to equip you with the knowledge of Jesus and His Word so that you can know Him and step into the calling that He's called you to. If you like this video, please subscribe and hit the like button. Thanks everyone. He made a scourge of cords, scourge, scourge. I don't know if it's scourge of curds. <laughs> scourge of curds. Okay.